Hello, everyone. Julie, how's it going? And thank you, Melanie, for that lovely introduction. It's great to be here at the Centre, which is an amazing institution. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, Melanie. It's really um, such an honour to be here tonight to talk to you, Peter, even though we were just joking about how we could be doing it from the same space since we live only a few streets away. Um, if I'm going to throw a rock right now, look out, it's coming. <laughs> should get on like tin cans with a string. Um, <laughs> this is an incredibly gorgeous book that I hope you've all already purchased through the Centre for Fiction's amazing um, bookstore. Uh, not just a brilliant book about the craft of revision, um, which I would expect no less of from Peter Ho Davies, but it's also a really moving meditation on fathers and sons. Um, so I, I really would rec recommend that you pick it up. Um, but before we dive in, I think it would be great to hear a little bit of the book from Peter, um, and then we'll move into some conversation and some questions from all of you. So as we talk, you can start throwing those questions in the Q&A box, and I'll kind of keep an eye on them throughout the conversation, and we'll turn to um, address them sort, sort of more formally towards the end. Um, Peter? Sounds good, and thanks for keeping an eye on the Q&A, Julie. I know mm -hmm. if I do that, I'll have to look like an owl to sort of read what's <laughs> going on in that box. And I'll have to do that a little bit to read from this passage. So I just wanted to read a couple of pages that I hope um, set up some of the ways I think about revision and, you know, a kind of uh, vision of revision that I'm trying to um, uh, suggest to folks along the way as well. Uh, it starts with an interesting quote, actually, from Benjamin Percy. Uh, Benjamin Percy makes a productive distinction between revision for novice and experienced writers. And I'm going to quote him. When revising, the beginning writer spends hours consulting the thesaurus, replacing a period with a semicolon, cutting adjectives, adding a few descriptive sentences, whereas the professional writer mercilessly lops off limbs, rips out innards like party streamers, drains away gallons of blood, and then calls down the lightning to bring back the body to life. We might list a catalog of things most of us needed to learn when we were beginners, avoiding the ticky repetitions of certain words, the reliance on cliche, the overuse of adverbs, etc. Many of these small elements of style have to be learned, which is to say that for most of us, they are at some point a feature of revision. The same is true for aspects of technique. When I was starting out, for instance, I didn't include much dialogue in my stories. Beginning writers, I suspect, have a common tendency to get stuck in a mode, either telling or showing. And I had to remind myself to incorporate scenes during revision. But that hasn't been true for a long time now. The toggling between modes of scene and narration has become more intuitive, natural even, as I've become more practiced. Which is to say that, like Ben Percy, my experience of revision has altered over time as I've revised myself as a writer, so much so that many of those hard-learned skills have become second nature, showing up even in first drafts. And this is good news, of course, but it also suggests that revision is something of a moving target, hard to pin down and define. Experienced writers still wrestle with revision, but such is the protean nature of the process that it's not the same revision as earlier in their careers. And what's fundamental to revision and suggest is not what the beginning writer does, but what the experienced writer does. Theoretically, I suppose there might be an infallible writer, one who with enough experience writes perfect first drafts, but I doubt it. Even God needed to start over after the flood and apparently still felt the need of a sequel. So what does it mean when a writer who has mastered all the technical skills still needs to revise? What's that essential core of revision? What's left to change? The lists of writing tips, however useful, that feature many articles and manuals about revision then, which seem to not tell the whole story. We begin to intuit that revision isn't just a catch-all description for various refinements of craft and style, but a skill in itself, a technique of its own, a state of mind even. What's left to change, it turns out, may be our own approach to revision. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Oh, of um, course. Thank you. I think that excerpt actually sort of really strikes at this first question that I have for you, which is just kind of the question of where this book came from and how it came to be. Um, you've been teaching for a long time, writing, and you could presumably write craft books on many different topics. I'm sure you've thought about it or you've given craft lectures on a lot of different things. Why, why this subject and why did it feel so important for you now? Yeah. And sort of where did it come from? That's a great question. I mean, I, I, you know, revision is... Um... An exciting part of the process for me, you know, I, I'm one of those writers, as I think I say in the book, that uh, I feel myself to have feet of clay, so often first drafts are dreadful and terrible, and so often for me the magic tends to happen in revision, it's an exciting space, it's a revelatory space actually, I would say for me as well, um, you know, I, I sort of suggest that 
it's not an accident that so many fictions, short fictions especially, work towards epiphany and revelation, because I actually think that the writing process, the revision process especially for me, and I think for many others, also works towards epiphany and revelation mm -hmm. in certain ways, so that the, the, the trajectories of our narratives and of our characters sort of models and echoes the trajectory of the writing of their stories, I think, in some ways as well. Um, but I think what also sort of inspired me is a, is a sense that revision is, you know, as I've talked about it a little bit, something of an invisible art in a way. I mean, not least because, you know, when we access revisions, we're nearly always just reading the final draft of somebody. That's the published version of a book that we see, right? Um, you know, occasionally some folks, uh, teachers uh, particularly, uh, editors like yourself in the past as well, get to see multiple drafts of a work, but that's still relatively rare, I think. And it's weird because I think most of the time as writers, most of the students we teach, most of us as writers, we learn from reading other writers, right? So we learn those aspects of technique I was talking about often by seeing how other people do them really well. But if revision is a little invisible, I think it also seems a little mysterious to folks mm -hmm. as well in various ways. And so I would often find that even though I think in my own teaching experience, everything we do in workshop sort of points this large neon arrow into the future of the story, into the direction of revision, essentially, that I would still encounter students um, who would come to me sometimes even late in their MFA career who would be like, I'm not sure how to revise or what revision is. And so it felt like a, a space that we needed to some, find some way of teaching into that I need to find some way of articulating and teaching into. And the book sort of comes out of a lot of those thoughts and ideas. Yeah, um, it's, it's so funny. I, while you were describing that, I, I thought of a moment that I had in workshop or after workshop, actually, not long after I started teaching at NYU, where someone came to me with, in that same way. Like, look, I've got all of, I've heard all of these things. I've gotten all this feedback, but like, what do I do now? <laughs> like, what yeah. is... What is revision? And you you articulate so many different ways to think about it in this book. I think one of the things that you say at some at one point is you describe it as a, as a state of mind, um, among other things. And I guess I sort of hate asking this because before the event started, you sort of made a joke about someone asking this, but I'm going to ask it anyways because I would like to be even more equipped to answer that question in the future, uh, which I already am thanks to your book. But uh, what does that look like sort of in a, in a concrete way? Like when you're sitting there, you've gotten that feedback, you're sifting through it at your desk, you have some sense maybe of which feedback you're going to prioritize, which is resonating with you, some sense of what you're not going to take with you. But what actually, what happens next? And maybe the answer, or maybe the answer to this that I'm really looking for is like, what does that look like for you? And you, and you give a few examples in the, in the book, but I'm curious, um, is it a new document? Yeah. Is it space? You know, you get what I'm right. saying. Well, so, so let me, let me answer uh, in a practical sense, first of all, because I do think mm -hmm. um, for me, post-workshop myself as a student, I think for a lot of our students and, you know, the people who come to me and come to you talking about yeah. what does revision look like? How do I start revision? These are good students. These are yeah. smart writers, yeah. right? Um, in some ways, I actually think the, the most talented writers for whom a yeah. polished first draft comes along are the ones who find it hardest to revise. And sometimes the break mm -hmm. into that polished first draft is one of the, mo the most challenging aspects of revision. Um, but I think for nearly everybody, when you hear feedback and good feedback from a good class or from a good editor, there's often a moment of feeling flooded by that feedback, overwhelmed by it. And so the, the tariff is high for starting yeah. revision. We often get stuck at that point, right? And I think the feeling is, where do I begin? What's the first thing to do? How do I prioritize these things? I think it's very serious. And there's a reasonable questions to ask ourselves, but I think we often feel a little stymied by just not knowing where to begin. Yeah. Um, so in a, at a super simple, but I think practically useful level, um, the advice I often give is do the easy stuff first. Mm -hmm. Do the things you agree with, the stuff that you know as we sit there and workshop, oh, I meant to do that. I know yeah. how to do that. And those things are often small, but I think they do a couple of things. One is they um, they allow us to feel that we're making a bit of progress. They're very good for our morale, but maybe even more deeply than that, they allow us to repossess our own work. So we're taking it back from the voices and the hands and all the marginal notations of all the teachers and fellow critics who've been looking at the work in some ways. We repossess our own work, get close to it again, I think in various ways. Um, but beyond that step, the thing that I often try and encourage folks to think about is not to not to do what they feel they should do or what the class is telling them to do or what a professor is telling them to do or even a, a respected reader or editor is telling them to do, but to lean into something that is exciting to them, something that will be fun to them, right? There's a kind of follow your own bliss quality to this, which sounds a little crunchy, but I think is, it's about saying that 
intuitively we recognize the places of heat in a story in the moments of excitement and also it's particularly the opportunities for discovery so the thing that excites us is usually an opportunity for discovery and so this is moving towards that mindset idea and it's a way of thinking about revision less as an act of perfecting a vision we've already had but in some ways by exploring and discovering new elements of that vision going deeper into a story um, I think that's super exciting um, and much less like a kind of chore based activity you know sometimes and you know I think we we talked about this sometimes occasionally with undergraduate classes when we ask them to revise it feels that like you're asking them to do the uncool part mm -hmm. of the process right it feels like you're like mom saying tidy your room but if they understand there's a discovery process involved that it's another phase of creation and creativity I think that's a great way to think into revision yeah I love that I love that response and that way of thinking about it I think one reason why I find that question is, is such a stumper is because there's something about it where the answer has to do with how you would write the first draft. <laughs> there's like there's like something about that feeling of discovery or inspiration um, that still should be essential to what happens next. And there isn't really like a checklist. It's like you can you can't really move progressively toward like through a series of actions to make a story stronger. It kind of doesn't work like that. But that's also why it is so it can be so revelatory and so fun. And and I think that's one thing this book really celebrates actually is how fun revision can be yeah. and how much discovery there can be in the process. And I guess I, I'm curious about something that sort of came up a little bit in the excerpt that you read and also comes up through the book, but you've written many, many books, you've written short stories, you've written historical fiction, you've written auto fiction, what might be called auto fiction. And I guess I'm curious, as you alluded to in what you've read, how, how this has changed for you, maybe book to book, or even if there's some examples of how you, how you thought about revision um, in, a, in a way that suits a specific project's needs and, and maybe what you've learned from doing that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think for me, one of the things that, um, that I learned uh, probably somewhat painfully uh, in the movement from writing stories to writing novels is that I think there are some significant distinctions between the revision process for each of those forms, I yeah. think in many ways, right? Um, you know, I, what I think of with a story, uh, particularly with a first draft, that that can be produced you know in a few days in a weekend in a week maybe in a couple of weeks depending on the length of the story but that we can sort of build that first draft however rickety or rough it might be fairly quickly so we have a wholeness we have this draft it may be very problematic it may be deeply flawed um it may be you know a very skinny bridge i think i, I often think about writing that first draft across the chasm of our self-doubt about whether we can get to the end right the image in my mind somehow is wily e. coyote running off the edge of the cliff but if he keeps running and doesn't look down maybe yeah, make the other maybe. side right? And, yeah right and first drafts feel like that and I think that's why we write them quickly, right? And we see this, of course, when people are writing for a deadline for workshop and you can sort of feel the yeah. endings of stories going a little too fast as the writer is like a sprinter at the end of a race dipping for the tape. But I think we have to write them quickly just to get something down and something done. And then often once we've got that done, we can build on it, right? So revision feels like an act of making something from something. It's a lot easier, I think, than making something from nothing. So getting to that first draft, that something, I think is a, is a great staging post for yeah. revision. But that's much easier for a story than it is for a novel. It's hard to sprint for months, let alone years, to get that first draft of a novel out. Some people can do it, but it's a tough thing to pull off, I think. Um, so it feels to me, and one of the things I certainly felt as I worked through um, certainly my first novel, The Welsh Girl, and I think it's also very much true of The Fortunes, is that feeling that novels revise themselves as they move forward in some ways, right? Which answers, I think, a fundamental question that novelists often pose us in, um, in classes. It's that feeling of, oh, I'm going to share 100 pages of my novel with you I'm going to get feedback on it uh oh do I now have to stop my forward momentum and go back yeah. and fix these pages yeah. and you know for some people that's the right choice some people need to feel like they're building a very firm foundation before they can press on that's something to do with our individual proclivities but I think for those who feel that forward rush of momentum they can also as they move forward in the text address questions that have been that have arisen about what's in the past of the text in a strange way that's the progress of a novel right if a character in a first chapter seems too passive that could seem like a criticism of that chapter you could change that in that chapter but over the course of the novel that character may come into action they may come into their own strengths that's what we call character development in the context of a larger novel. So it feels like we can sometimes revise as we press forward. And I think it took me a long time to figure that out. Um, and even maybe to embrace the idea that, well, you know, I, the weirdness of a novel, I think, is a kind of strange, I can sometimes feel like a 
vicious circle, almost a bootstrapping problem <laughs> that we, you know, we, we have to write our story to find out what our story is, right? And that's part of the discovery process, part of the excitement of doing it. But when we embark upon that writing, we have to at least make some tentative assertions. Uh, I call them hypotheses of how best to tell our story, what point of view, what moment in time, how do we frame it? Um, and yet, as we move through it, we often discover as we know our story better that the way we've chosen to tell it, the initial choice for how we tell it, may not be the ideal choice for how to tell it. And so often that requires us to recursively return to the beginning and say, oh, I know a better way to tell the story now that I've learned a little bit more about it. Or sometimes after we come to what I think of as part one, we go, okay, I've told it this way, get me this, this far, but to tell the rest of it, I need to change the mode of telling. Part two, different time frame, different point of view, all those kind of questions. So that's also a way of this kind of sense of revision on the fly, I think, moving forward with the text. Yeah, you say, I think at one point, and forgive me if I'm paraphrasing you, you, you can correct me if I'm getting it wrong, but like first we write to know, right, in that first draft, we revise to know more, and then the final draft is I've written what I now know, which is which feels so right in, in terms of how that journey progresses. And again speaks to the fact in that sort of revised to know more that that again is this unearthing of of just more possibilities in our stories and more um just more discovery again that feeling of inspiration um i i'm curious about the relationship between your work as a teacher and how you've come to some of these come to some of these questions and maybe um how they've possibly even sort of hastened your own skills as a reviser of your work. So for example, you mentioned at one point um, some common pitfalls that you see in workshop, which is, I don't know, an, a tendency to err on the side of opacity, which I think workshop instructors see frequently or, or writers who get stuck in a mode um, like telling versus showing, getting stuck in a sort of a telling mode, something I've been guilty of many times. It's um, treating revision like a checklist. I guess I'm curious, like, do you think for the writers and writer teachers who might be listening that there's a sort of like side effect of learning these things kind of quickly from having to be in a position of of learning to read the work and and maybe as an extension of that question how can workshop participants like turn on that reading brain in such a way that they can then apply it to their own fiction after after the fact yeah. it's a little convoluted but i think maybe you get what i'm no no I, I, I it's it's a great question and i'm already feeling the slight burden of being an older colleague speaking to a younger colleague <laughs> to this question, because I feel like I'm going to, um, at least for my own part, um, I'm not sure it quite works that way. I mean, yeah. I, I, I learn from my teaching and yeah. from seeing the problems that students are presenting. Uh, I hope I learn to be able to better help them address those problems uh, as I go forward, right? So the next generation of students tend to benefit a little bit from the experience I had with the previous generation of students and mm. so on and so forth over time. Do, um, do those observations help me with my own yeah. writing? It feels more like what I'm often bringing to the table is also what I've learned from my own struggles in certain ways, mm -hmm. mostly as a writer. So I'm feeling like here are the, my mistakes and here are the traps that I fell into. And look, it's like, there's a bear trap there. Try to avoid falling into that hole, to go in this direction, <laughs> right? Um, so it feels more as if it's that way round, I suspect for me. Yeah, um, yeah. And a lot of these things feel as though I learned them painfully and more importantly, even the pain, I learned them slowly. So it feels like you're trying to accelerate the students through some of those uh, uh -huh. challenges and questions, you know, but also to excuse them or explain them, right? So that, that sense of stuck, getting stuck in a mode, we tell yeah. too much, we narrate too much, right? Um, that's, it's a proclivity one way or the other, we get stuck in the mode, sure, but it's also um, a sign in early drafts of wanting to have that speed. We're trying to build that draft quickly. Telling is more efficient and faster very often as a mm. mode of telling the story. So it's, a, it's an artifact of our impatience, I think, in those ways, and very understandable impatience in a first draft. Part of what you're saying to people is, you can sprint in that first draft. Maybe the first draft metabolism is that of a sprinter, mm. but maybe the revisionary metabolism is a little bit more um, of a marathon runner. So maybe you, you yeah. change that energy, I think, in various ways. So some of these things um, feel that they come out of uh, hard run experience. And maybe what I'm doing is saying, I wish somebody had been around to tell me yeah. some of this stuff, and then you hopefully pass it forward in those ways. Yeah. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I see um, a question in the Q&A from Joanne who didn't understand what I meant by a tendency towards opacity, which is um, a good point, Joanne. It's something that Peter talks about in his in his book a little bit. Um, and Peter, maybe I'll let you talk about it. I'm thinking about the part where you talk about um, the difference between vagueness and mystery and maybe there being a slight um, proclivity towards uh, leaning on the side of making some, not explaining something mm -hmm. It, rather yeah. than over explaining something, um, I'll so let you. This goes a little bit to the sense that I think often in revision, we're thinking about um, calibration of various effects in a narrative, right? So maybe this will be a little harder on screen, but you can see my hand. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest there's kind of, um, as there are in many different ways in the story, there's kind of a spectrum that we're engaging with as we engage with the story itself. And one of those uh, ranges, one of those spectrums might run from, on the one hand, the story is too heavy handed over here, I guess that's my right. And on the other hand, um, it is too subtle, right? Which is that space of being a little too mysterious, a little too opaque, uh, harder for the reader to understand. And probably somewhere on that spectrum, and it'll vary, of course, and for every reader and writer, this is a very reductive way of thinking into this as a thought experiment, but somewhere on that spectrum, there's a sweet spot, maybe my nose should be hitting the sweet spot, <laughs> um, which is the perfectly calibrated, the Goldilocks place where it is, you know, we often talk about this, right, a surprise of pre-years for the reader, but it feels like a prepared for a surprise, right, so we're looking for that moment in the middle of the text, somewhere on that middle of that spectrum. But most of us as writers, I think, particularly writers going into workshop, tend to err on one side or the other of that sweet spot. And I think most of them, uh, and most of us, myself certainly very much included, err on the side of mm, too subtle, right? And there are a couple of reasons for that. It's partly embedded in the language I've just been using, right? Heavy handed just sounds bad, mm -hmm. too subtle, I think, well, subtlety is a good thing. Yeah. Too much of a good thing. That can't be too bad, right? So we, we tend, I think, to err a little bit more on that side. But it's also, I think, a defensive strategy when we share work in workshop. Um, if my story is a little opaque, if it's a little too subtle, then the critic who doesn't get it didn't get it. And therefore, their criticism is perhaps hobbled by the fact that they didn't understand the story. So I am protected from their criticism by actually self-defending myself from allowing them to understand my story in certain ways. So out of our anxieties as we enter into this space of sharing work, we tend, I think, to err on this side of this gentler space of criticism. As we revise, ideally, we want to go, I want to go from being too subtle towards the, the Goldilocks spot, the sweet spot along the way. And one of the ways we can do that is by creeping up to it. I'll make the story just a little less subtle, maybe just a little bit less subtle, maybe just a little bit less subtle. And I think of this as um, Zeno's revision after Zeno's paradox, where the arrow flies towards the target, it gets halfway, it gets halfway again, it gets halfway again, but it never quite gets there in Zeno's paradox, right? I think a more effective way of finding that sweet spot is to say, I have undershot it once in one draft? Mm -hmm. What if it would mean to allow myself to overshoot it in the next, to fall on this side of the sweet spot on one occasion, to fall on the other side in the next draft? One of the things that's so useful about that move is that you now know the sweet spot lies between those two places. I think it's easier to find the place you want to get to by allowing yourself to undershoot and then maybe to overshoot, rather than just to creep up from one side of the spectrum into that territory. So that's probably the way I'm yeah. thinking about those dangers yeah. and for opacity and over subtlety in that case. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. That also gets at something that I think um, was really fascinating to to hear you sort of speak about in the text, which is this idea, I think so often, right, we come to revision thinking like, I need to cut, I need to cut, I need to like get to the story yeah, right. that's in the, sto the good story in my baggy draft or right. like, but actually sometimes with our early drafts, there's, there's more unearthing to do, there's more expansion to do. I, I think you call it expansion um, is the form patience takes on the page or something along those lines like which is beautiful right there's like this idea that that might need to be um just as important of a part of the process as that sort of editing and streamlining and i i suppose i'm interested um in in hearing again maybe i'm just trying to i i guess i'm curious about if if there's like a book that you've worked on where you've done just that like have you over like written um, way, way over and, and what did you, how did you know? And then what did you take out? Um, basically, I'm just asking you to tell me how you do what you do so that I can then do it. Oh, well, oh, oh you're talking about asking me about what is that painful process by yes. which you came to yes. this, this idea? Um, and actually, you know, there is um, a lot to be said for that. I think, I think partly this is coming out of uh, my own sort of 
experience of being workshopped, which is a tendency we all have, like we share a story. Workshop is a great mechanism for finding fault. So one of the ways mm -hmm. we can take away from that space is, to, oh, I'll take out the things that don't work. I've got my story. I will subtract all the stuff that's no good. And then what am I left with? And often what we're left with at that point is maybe a story that doesn't have obvious flaws, but maybe is also a story that doesn't work and doesn't have obvious strengths either, I think, in certain ways. So that sense of subtraction, tempting as it might be, can sometimes feel um, like it's sucking something really important out of the narrative, I think, in various ways. And partly because of that speed of composition for early drafts, as we've been talking about, that rush to get done, I think that does suggest that often we don't allow our stories to expand and explore as much as they might. They might. Mm -hmm. So one obvious example of that is that feeling of the rushed ending where the sprinter is dipped for the tape at the very final uh, stretch of the, of the narrative. Maybe we could hang around a little bit longer and take a little bit longer to expand and write through that ending as one obvious space and typical space of expansion along the way. But more broadly, I like to think of um, drafts as in a way being living things right mm -hmm. so they breathe out and they breathe in and there's often a sort of cycling of expansion and contraction mm -hmm. often the expansion is there in order to find out what we know a little bit more about and once we know it more explicitly maybe we can redact it a little bit as well but we have to write into it i think to know it in the first place and for me probably the most radical um and uh, that and challenging learning experience for this was that, again, that work on my novel, The Welsh Girl, which yeah. sort of props up a little bit in this book. Uh, I'm thinking into that experience. Um, and that was a book that uh, went through radical phases of cutting and then growth. It started off um, as a kind of 550 page mm -hmm. draft that I think was as the kitchen sink draft, everything I thought about the book thrown in there, incredibly messy, um, dismaying to some of my editors. Um, and I cut it back radically to about 150 pages. And it felt like I found the core narrative, the spine of the book in that process. Um, and because the book was at that point so far over deadline, um, I thought, well, this is publishable. Please take it, then <laughs> uh, keep the money. You've got a book. We're all happy and we'll walk away. And, and I've always been enormously grateful, both to my uh, agent, Mary Massey, but also to my editor back then, Janet Silver at Houghton Mifflin. Um, Janet had more patience for the project than I did. So she gifted me that patience, mm -hmm. which felt like an incredible editorial um, mm -hmm. gift to me. And she said, look, some of the, what you've cut, I think is valuable. Why don't you take some time to see what you can restore? Mm -hmm. And so gradually I took that 150 page skinny latte version of it as I think of it and built it back up to that Goldilocks version, yeah. which now in its finished form is about 350 pages or so. And it felt like there was that process yeah. of you know breathing in and then breathing out again. And it felt important to do that to try and figure out what the right place to be yeah. was for the book. Yeah, I love um, hearing that story. It, it's so instructive and helpful. And I think it also, it makes me think about those times as a teacher where um, maybe you have someone submit a story to workshop. It's a great workshop. You can tell they're leaving sort of charged up with full of ideas and energy on what to do. They get in touch with you a few months later and they're like, hey, will you read my revision? And you read the revision and you're like, oh no, <laughs> it's worse. But, but it's not worse, right? It's worse for the moment on the yes. way to being better than it could have been without right. the worst the worst possibility behind door number two. Or, so I, I guess I'm curious as a teacher, how do you how do you help students through those moments and or just advice for the room, I guess? Like what do you do to sustain yourself through that moment when you realize mm -hmm. like, oh, I've messed it up and maybe you don't even know yet if you've messed it up in a in a way that will ultimately be positive. Yeah. Like how do you sort of keep the faith when that's happening? So it's, it's important, I think, to remind ourselves that um, every draft in the revision process bar one is a draft that suggests a further draft is necessary, mm -hmm. right? And I would argue that to some degree, a successful revision, a successful draft is one that points the way to the next phase of revision, right? It's clarified a question, identified a problem, suggested the next thing we might undertake, I think, in various ways. Um, you know, there is, I think, also this kind of one step forward, two steps back quality to revision that can sometimes confound us. Um, and all of these things are very often allied to our impatience. We want to be finished. We want to be done. We want to be, hey, here's the perfected version of the narrative. But if we embrace the idea of discovery, I think that idea of, well, I fixed something, but it raised two new questions about the draft. Those new questions, that complication, which makes us feel like we're further away from being done, is also on another uh, perspective, 
a way of suggesting those are opportunities to add richness and depth and and uh, and, uh, and wealth to my story. I think in certain ways, right? So we can see these opportunities um, not just as challenges or barriers, but as ways of actually enhancing and improving and deepening our stories. I think in various ways. The way I often try and frame it um, for folks, because I do think this sort of stuttery process of revision, that feeling of going forward and then going backwards, or maybe sometimes going sideways is, is sometimes the case as well, feels as though it is undermining of our morale. It feels as though it is the opposite of progress, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the ways I try to frame progress is not in the context of finished pages or the end is coming closer and closer necessarily, but to say it in really simple terms, which is that, Today, do you know more about your story and your character than you did yesterday? At the end of this draft, do you know more about your story and your characters than you did at the, end of the, at the end of the previous draft? If that knowledge has increased, right? Even if you feel this draft is not successful, it will have taught you something, not least it will have taught you that what I've just changed is not the right way to go in the story. And that's valuable data, right? So thinking about progress, I think in, in that sense of us knowing our stories better, that seems like a pretty healthy way to think into that space. And I also, of course, um, draw partly from my own now very distant background in the sciences on this sort of experimental and experimenters perspective, which is to say each draft is a kind of experiment. I'm testing a hypothesis. If I try this, will that take me closer mm -hmm. to the narrative? And I think what we tend to feel, at least in the scientific context, is that a failed experiment is not a failure. If the hypothesis has been tested and proven to be false, that is an addition to our knowledge. And it means we have to go back and formulate a new hypothesis and move on. But that's not wasted effort. It's actually foreclosed a problematic uh, wrong direction. And now we know that's not the right way to go. We've learned something from that. Even if it move, makes us move back, we can then from that moving backwards move forward again. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a, another question about kind of one way to move forward when you're stuck in a revision, but before I ask it, um, I just want to give the audience a quick heads up that um, if you have a question, you can throw it in the Q&A box, and I'll probably be starting to pull from them in a few minutes, so if you want to throw them in there, um, go right ahead. So Peter, one thing that I felt was a pretty, um, was a pretty a, a great kind of concrete takeaway here in terms of like something writers might be able to do right now, if you're not already doing, and I think a lot of writers already do this, is keep a kind of a document of, dar of darlings that they've cut or, um, you know, instead of killing their darlings, sort of preserving them, preserving their dead bodies in a separate place to resuscitate later. And you talk about, and forgive me if I'm getting the titles wrong, but I think it's The Bad Shepherd is the short story that yeah. you wrote using a cut darling from the Welsh girl, right? Yeah. Um, it, can you talk about how, just sort of what that document looks like? Sorry to be so concrete minded, but I think yeah. it, it helps people, right? Like, is that something that you do that's just on your computer? It says darlings, it's got all your darlings in it. It says <laughs> from every project you've ever worked on, is it project specific? How do you know if one of those has enough life to become something else? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure there's an actual file for me, although mm -hmm. um, I do talk a little bit in the book, uh, partly because I, I want to try not to make this all about me, although, you know, of course, the invisibility <laughs> of revision is sort of the excuse for talking a little bit about my own revisionary experiences, because they're the ones that I have access to, and they're the ones that are visible to me, I think, in certain ways. Um, but I think, uh, you know, several other folks talk about, um, you know, the graveyard, right? So mm -hmm. we kill the darlings, we put them in the graveyard. Um, although hopefully they come back as zombies, I suppose, in a certain <laughs> form, rather. I think somebody else uses the phrase that they're a kind of compost heap in some ways mm -hmm. as well. So there are lots of different metaphors we might bring to bear in those regards. Um, I think I resist um, the very idea of killing our darlings. It's a little mm. too brutal. I like to think about, in my mind's eye, I'm saving them. Maybe I, I'm marooning them on a desert island somewhere to be picked up later on. That's sort mm. of the way I think about that. And often, you know, they're set free on a raft or a, in a lifeboat to float off for a little while and then yeah. they'll come back. But I don't actually have a, an ongoing large yeah. file of this. They're often little scraps that are in separate files of their own. Um, and often they're floating around in the memory, yeah. right? The things that are really, the memory is kind of a sorter of those darlings, I think, in some ways. Mm -hmm. And then you also intuitively trust the memory to resuscitate one of them when you need it, yeah. I think, in some ways. The thing I'm thinking about is less that they feel as though one of them will say, I am a story in its, mm -hmm. in its own right, although that occasionally happens, but more the feeling that this is a piece that belongs somewhere else in the writing that I'm doing. So, you know, the example I sometimes give and the image that, um, that I like is uh, that somehow all of the work I'm going to generate over a career, over a lifetime, is like a large jigsaw puzzle that I'm putting together. 
right? And so when we do a jigsaw puzzle, we come up with a piece. Oh, it's blue. I'll try and jam it in here in the sky that I'm part of the corner that I'm working on at the moment. And it doesn't fit. But we don't then just throw it away. We just assume that we'll find a place for it somewhere yeah. else. And later, we, oh, I'm working on the sea. Oh, that blue bit, that fits in here. It always belonged here. This is the right mm. place for it. Mm -hmm. It's something that has happened not every time and not with every one of these darlings, but enough times in my writing life that it feels as though now I have this hope that these darlings, I'm going to take it away somewhere, but it'll find its rightful place, a more correct place than the one I'm trying to jam it into now. It'll find that place if I have some patience and think about where else it might belong, even if it's a story that I have not yet conceived of, even if it's something I might write down the line in various ways. Um, so there's maybe an act of... Yeah. Um, salvage what this is concerned. So with, um, with that story, The Bad Shepherd, I think in that case, uh, that was a working title for the Welsh girl. I loved it. Uh, it was, however, something of a red herring because it focused on the wrong character. The Welsh girl is a different character mm. from The Bad Shepherd. Um, but I love the title. Uh, and I was able to deploy it um, as the title of a fragment of that book. Is that book mm. now a World War II novel? But at one point, um, and this would have been not a 550 page draft, it would have been a thousand page draft. That novel was going to go from 1940 to about 1980. Um, and I never quite got to 1980, but The Bad <laughs> Shepherd, the story that exists, is yeah. about what would have happened in 1980. Yeah. But it's sort of like, it's like Teflon, right? It's yeah. like a spin off of the space program. And I kind of like those <laughs> products of our writing as well. Yeah, I love this, uh, thinking about it this way too, because it also is a reminder, right, that revision isn't necessarily a project by project process. It's, it's, a, it's a process that is engaged in across a writing life in different ways and the work we do speaks to each other. And um, we're not just sort of like writing one story, like that's done, moving on to the next. There's something else going on, um, going on. So we have a bunch of questions. Oh, oh so good. I, well, I was just gonna in a strange way, no, because you excited me by that thought. You know, I, I talk a little bit about the dangers of um, if we don't revise, we get into this Groundhog yeah. Day situation uh, that um, we write a first draft, we don't know how to revise it, we put it away, and then we write a new story, and yet somehow that new story will somehow still uh, deal with some of the issues and the themes yeah. of the previous story. So we get into this loop of always being obsessed about these subjects, never quite finishing a story, so we can yeah. never quite break out of that loop. Um, but the plus version of that, the, the beneficial side of that, is that sometimes these little darlings that we take out of one place, they may return later on. Mm -hmm. So there are sometimes this carryover that can be beneficial, I think, in some ways as well. Yeah, that section also is just such a, the, the section you just referred to, um, where you talk a little bit about the tension between like the fear of over revising and then the fear of the risk of not sufficiently revising, I think was a, is a comfort for anyone who does over revise or <laughs> finding yourself sort of stuck in that loop, a reminder, right, that there's such value to sort of figuring out how to move through that material too. Um, okay, so we've got a ton of questions here. I'm going to try to read them quickly and see if any of them can be sort of fused together, um, which might take just one second. Sure, no problem. Okay, it looks like maybe while I'm doing this, Peter, um, I think here's one that is would be interesting to uh, talk about a little bit. This is a, this is a specific sort of first for, first draft question. Um, a writer named Paula asked, do you recommend workshopping a first draft? Um, she's kind of wondering like is it what is the best use of her workshop time to start with a draft that's totally raw and um has maybe never been seen by anyone else before versus like a third or fourth um do you have any advice about that or any no, that's, a, that's a great question i mean i think um you know ideally of course we want to go to workshop with a story that we have advanced as far as we can and yet we still know that it has difficulties and has problems right so we are We've done work to it. We've brought it a certain distance. We feel a little stuck with it. We have a, an intuition that something's not quite working. That's a great story to bring to workshop, right? so they can help us address issues that we see within the story. Um, the problem is that in a real world situation, we don't all get to bring that perfect story to workshop, the one that's ready for workshop or perfectly attuned to workshop. And so I often think um, it's a little weird to be paraphrasing Donald Rumsfeld in this regard, that we go to workshop with the stories that we have, right? Yeah. And I've certainly done that, right? We've all been obliged to do that. And I still think there's value in that experience, right? Um, the only thing I think I, I try to occasionally discourage uh, my own students from doing is 
the story they wrote last night, they bring that to workshop. It feels like they haven't even had um, the basic sort of buffering time of, I read it a couple of days ago, I've read it again, I've seen things in it that I can easily fix. And so if they haven't done that, then the workshop will essentially be telling them things they could already have figured out for themselves, I think. So in that regard, the workshop experience um, can be not as valuable to them as it might be optimally. Yeah. Um, that's really helpful. I think, um, let's move to this one from Sharon, who is, Sharon asked a question about um, I, sort of like workshop mechanic or revising mechanics, I guess. So she's feeling like there's kind of a divide between revising for plot or character, um, like approaching, and Sharon, if I'm um, paraphrasing wrong, just feel free to say it in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it. Um, so like revising something, doing a big revision of plot or a big revision of character or maybe theme. Um, I know for some writers that's a strategy versus revising sort of line by line for flow and word choice and sound. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to approach this sort of line by line revision? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe any techniques or strategies that you that you use um, versus one that's uh, like more about the overall mechanics of the story? Yeah, no, that's a great question uh, and a really interesting way of thinking into this. So there are a couple of ways that I, I, I tend to think about that for myself on a line by line basis, particularly when I'm thinking about language and flow. Um, that's a moment where I often for myself go back to a technique that you know several other people suggest, and I talk about a little bit in the book, which is to read the story aloud. Right, there's no moment when we are more sensitized to, you know, oh that line is too long because I've run out of breath. Right, we hear um, the echo or the chime or the unfortunate rhyme, maybe in a line where we've repeated a word or repeated a sound. I think it's always unintentionally. Um, one of the things that I think is really valuable about that is that we become sort of locked into a sense of a story that we've been working on for a while, particularly if it's on the page or on the screen. We've seen it in this mode over and over again. So it becomes almost as though the way it looks has become somewhat inevitable. To read it aloud and not just, you know, uh, whisper it to ourselves because we're worried our roommate will overhear us. I have to wait for my family to actually leave the house before I read my work aloud because I want to actually en enunciate it. Um, that's partly about we're embodying it, right? So we feel the language as it passes over our, out of our throat and over our lips and over our tongue. Um, but we're also apprehending it through a different sensory organ. Uh, we're not just seeing it, we're also hearing it. And I think that changes our relationship to it. So, so much of what we do in revision is about a shift in perspective, right? It's that shift in perspective in a fundamental way from thinking as the writer of our work, we know it intimately, to coming back to it as the reader of our work and trying to figure it out as if we were just the reader of this work. But hearing it too feels like a shift of perspective in those regards. So that for me is very useful in terms of thinking about language and flow. But the other way I think sometimes that for me has been quite useful as well is to not always re-encounter a work in revision um, in its own natural sequence, to not read it from beginning to end, mm -hmm. but sometimes to, to drop into a scene, sometimes out of order, maybe even sometimes to work my way backwards, which is a way of thinking, taking the focus away a little bit from plot development, some of these other larger questions we're talking about, and focusing down a little bit more into the question of how is this passage working, if I think about it almost in isolation. Um, great, thank you, Peter. I think I have two questions um, that are sort of similar. Howard and Evan both have a question about, about sort of, oh, actually, I'm sorry, Howard, I'll come to yours next. Kenneth and Evan both have a question about um, sort of taking, taking some time away from a project when you're working on a draft. Um, they're slightly different questions, but I, I guess I'm, they're both curious about how, how that helps, does it help? Is it something you've done? And um, just a further elaboration on it from Evan, he's stuck in a sort of Groundhog Day problem where he's set aside a rough draft or something, starting a rough draft of another project. And he's just kind of in all of these different projects at once, maybe yeah. circling some of the same stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so there are a couple of ways of thinking about that. We have used the word several times, Julian, I use it several times in the book, this word patience, right? Mm. To have patience with the process. So this idea of stepping away or changing our temporal perspective upon the work feels really useful to me, I think, right? We're caught up in that white hot heat of the first draft. We need some time to reflect. So in a classic way of thinking into this, um, you know, uh, we might, and I certainly have done this from time to time, we get very excited about a draft, we write it down in a hurry, at a certain point in that writing process we go, oh shit, this is not as good as I hoped it to be, it's not the platonic ideal I had when I set out upon this, and we are discouraged, 
so much so in many instances we can't bear to look at the mess we've made of this beautiful idea we put that draft in a drawer we never want to look at it again um and what often happens to me is that about six months later i'm working on some other story and this new story sucks even worse than that old one and that old one suddenly suddenly looks just a little bit better than it did at the time i open the drawer up i look at it again and because those six months have passed i have in some sense forgotten what I meant by that story or forgotten why I made some of the choices. So again, we moved to that space where I'm no longer reading it as its writer, but reading it as a reader, trying to figure out as I would for somebody else's story, why is this happening? Why is that character doing that? Why is this choice of language being made? So that analysis brings me back to that story with fresh eyes, essentially the eyes of a reader rather than just the writer who thought he knew what he was doing, uh, as I evidently didn't six months ago. Now, six months can feel like a long time, right? So one of the ways we think about accelerating that perspectival shift is sharing work with others, right? That moment we all know, even before we hear feedback, when we hand out a story in workshop, when we hit send or submit a story to a competition or a journal, that's a moment when we all suddenly go, shit, I meant to fix that. And that's an intuition of other eyes being on the work. So we understand, I think, that somebody else is going to look at it. And as soon as we begin to imagine that, we see through those eyes and see something in the text that we've forgotten to address earlier on. Um, so those are all ways in which I think that sense of patience, a little temporal space, putting something aside for a while, is very useful. The hard part is, what are we doing as writers when we put that thing aside? Right? We often, I think, want to be working on something else. We don't want to feel like we've just not write, we're not writing for six months. That doesn't seem like a very useful way of thinking into this space. And, and I think the, the way I try to speak into that a little bit is the idea that we we often, I think, toggle between different modes as we write. Right. So when we have been revising a long time on a particular story, it can start to feel a little claustrophobic. The walls are closing in on us a little bit. We get a little bored with the work that we're engaged in as well, and suddenly the prospects of breaking ground on a new story or the wide open spaces of a novel, those sound incredibly exciting to us, right? Um, and I think there's something to be said for following those instincts, right? If the novel, the revision is feeling a little too claustrophobic, by all means, spread your wings into a new project, right? Have, enjoy the freedom of that. But as we also know, as we spread out into that free space, particularly if it's a novel, there can some, come, sometimes come a point about halfway through a novel where you go, boy, this is a lot, this, all, this freedom is all very well and good, but it would be really nice to finish something sometime. And mm -hmm. that's the moment when we often pivot back to, oh, that revision looks very attractive suddenly because it gives me the promise of maybe getting done with something in various ways. And I think it's fine to, um, to make those pivots back and forth. There's a kind of dialectic in the work that we can have where we can pivot between breaking new ground and revising something. Um, as long as we understand or are, are aware of those inclinations, I think, and lean into them and, make, and use them to our advantage, I think. Thanks, Peter. Um, so we have we have a few more questions left, and I think um, a, a couple of these can also be fused. Maybe Joan, Joan, and Tamar both have questions about um, about revising a project and sort of realizing that something isn't working and maybe needs to be restructured entirely, changing the order of the chapters. Or um, and Tamar asks us too, like what happens if you are telling something through the wrong character's perspective and you have that realization yeah. midway through a project um and then joan goes a little farther and is also curious about you know how how to sort of set off on the right foot with the novel how do you know a first page of them working so yeah i mean the that discovery which of course is a kind of great horror for us in the middle of a novel but the 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 means I adopted initially that I thought would help me tell this story have become somehow a limitation or even invalidated. I've learned enough about my story to know this is not the way to tell my story. And, and there are two ways of thinking about that. Um, one way might be to say, well, that draft has been useful in suggesting that there is a different way to tell this story. And we have to live with this idea that we have to maybe return to the beginning and tell it in the way that is now better informed by our knowledge of the story. That doesn't mean that first draft is wasted effort. It's actually been really useful. We've learned about our narrative enough to understand how better to tell it. Um, but the other strategy I think is this feeling of maybe the way I've told it has carried me thus far the first 100 pages, the first 150 pages. And now I've run into that wall where this mode of telling is not sufficient to tell the rest of the story. And that is the end of part one. And part two tells it in a different way or moves it forward in a different way. Um, I mean, I think a lot of novels have this strange lumpy structure that they reinvent themselves structurally as they move along. Some, I think, deliberately. I mean, the examples I use in the book are um, Lauren Gross, Fates and Furies. Um, and, and I imagine, 
I think it's almost certainly true that Lauren had that structure in mind from quite early on, but it's still a way of representing a kind of bump in the middle of the book. The book has chosen to tell itself in a different way from its midpoint onwards. Um, the other example I think of is uh, Susan Choi's Trust Exercise. These are both wonderful novels, I should say. Um, and Susan, I think, and I think I've talked to her a little bit about this. She visited one of my classes recently. Um, the first part of that book is one energy, and the second part of that book is a re-examination of that first part. But I think that maybe not, was not initially in mind, and it feels as though she's retelling or reimagining or finding a new way to tell a narrative to carry it forward. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, so I want to get to both of these last questions if we have time. I think we should be able to. Um, Nadia, hi Nadia, she asks, how, how does a seasoned writer approach workshop feedback? And I think, you know, we've kind of talked about this a little bit in the beginning of our conversation, Peter, this idea that as you become sort of a more experienced writer, your relationship to revision changes. Um, so I think Nadia's question kind of asks maybe for a little bit more about what that looks like as you develop your craft. Well, I suppose there's that feeling, I think when we first get a lot of feedback from workshop, we're trying to filter that feedback but we're not sure of our filter, right? The more seasoned we become, I suppose, uh, the more sure of ourselves and what we're doing, the more we're able to do that filtering. I think all of us are, are in that space of filtering, right? We're thinking, I agree with this, I don't agree with that, I'm gonna choose to do this, I'm gonna choose not to do that. Um, sometimes we don't have the confidence to reject the things that we're doubtful about, right? And we waste some time thinking into those spaces. The tricky part is thinking about that middle ground, right? Where we feel as though, the critic or the workshop may have identified something that feels problematic in the story. We might agree with the problem being identified, but we're not quite sure that maybe a solution that's being suggested is the right one for us. And that's always the trickiest space, but that also feels like a space of um, trial and error, right? I think it's very useful to know there's a difficulty there. Probably we're agreeing with that or intuitively understanding there's a difficulty in that space. But even hearing solutions that aren't the right one can often clarify for us what might be the right one in some ways, right? Um, so we can recognize that's not quite right, but maybe that clarifies what the problem might be. And then we have to do this process of trial and error, this experimental process to see if that's not the solution, what might be the solution? How else might I address that space? Yeah, um, yeah, that's so helpful, Peter. I love thinking about that. Like the solution sometimes, sometimes you're not getting, none of the solutions you hear are gonna be the right one for your right. story, but the reactions that you have to them and what you sort of, uncover from those conversations, that can be the way forward. Um, yeah, it makes me think about the way that, you know, we are influenced by the things we love and agree with, but we're also influenced by the things, things we disagree we with, right? <laughs> yeah, we go in the other direction from this. And being able yeah. to have the confidence to listen to that instinct as well is really valuable yeah. to all of us. Yeah. So our last question, I saved Howard's question for last because in some ways it feels like the question of, of this conversation <laughs> and maybe a revision in general. I think I know what's um, coming, sure. <laughs> Howard wants to know, when or how can one determine revision has arrived at the sweet spot or conclusion? Um, yeah. And I'm thinking of Peter, some of your comments about, you know, perfection versus wholeness, and and sort of how do we, how do we know when we when we finished finished it? Yeah. Um, so the, the short answer to the hard question is uh, you have to read the book because it's in there. But no, I'm not going to be that big. No, no. But it is it's a subject that is very close to my heart. This question of doneness: how do we know when we're done? And um, there is a lot in the book on this. But to summarize it, it feels to me as though the journey I'm often on with a story is a journey to understand ultimately why I finally wrote it, right? We think we know why we're writing a story when we embark on it. We have to have a hypothesis. We have to have a theory of where we're going. I think I know what it means. But for me, the revision process is a kind of examination of and a refinement of what does this story mean? Why did I write it? What does it mean to me? So it feels like I'm on a journey with the story. So for me, the final phase, that's just done this often revelatory, as we talked about, often a moment of epiphany when I go, oh, that's what's been here all along. And I was just too dumb to see it at the get-go, right? Um, but I think it's also a moment where the journey is concluded because it feels as though my work and my relationship with the story is over. It's not a question of perfection, right? It's not necessarily about, oh, I could keep on honing the language further. I no longer need to do that because the honing of the language is just about my engagement with the story and my sense of trying to understand what it means. But when I get to that point, very often, it's deeply satisfying for me. And the amount of changes that are made in revision at that point, sometimes are very small. They're actually relatively brief, but it feels like I'm finally done at that point when I understand why I wrote this story in the first place. Yeah. 
I think that's a really beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much, Peter. And I hope you'll you. all read this book where there's so much more um, beauty and wisdom about writing and being a person <laughs> to be found. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Julia. Really appreciate the question. So thank you, everybody. Those are great questions. Really appreciate you guys being here. Thank you both. That was so great. And um, and the book, it's only $14. You can save yourself thousands of dollars and many <laughs> hours of self-flagellation and have a seasoned... Uh, professor of writing with you at all times when you buy it um, and a great novelist as well. Thank you both. Um, thanks to our audience for joining us and um, we hope to see you all again soon.